Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews almost 25 years now, since 1996, and you can read all of my written work there at that website, Quipster.net. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. I don't just cover films of the 1980s. I cover all eras of films, but I do another podcast that looks at more recent movies that are out in theaters or VOD or streaming services. It's called the Quipster Film Review Podcast. You can find the link to that at my website, Quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be getting into the third part of this three-part series, looking at insidious aliens, aliens that have infiltrated Earth, our government, and are controlling our minds and our activities. The last two movies, well, they weren't movies, but they were miniseries. They were the V miniseries, the first V miniseries in 1983, as well as its follow-up, V the Final Battle in 1984. This film I'm going to be talking about today has a lot of similarities to the V story structure, especially when it comes to dealing with the aliens and how they're using the media to control us. It is called They Live. It came out in 1988. It is a film that is written and directed by John Carpenter. Frank Armitage was the screenplay credit, but it's actually a pseudonym. John Carpenter did write it. It's an R-rated film. It does have violence, including one lengthy, brutal fight, language, and brief sexuality and nudity. The runtime is a short hour and 33 minutes. Roddy Piper is the main star. Keith David, Meg Foster, George Flower and Peter Jason get supporting roles. Now, when you think about They Live, if you've seen it, you know that it's it's a fairly laid back kind of action movie. It's a science fiction movie primarily, but it does definitely emphasize a lot of action at certain moments. It stars Roddy Piper. If you know you're wrestling, you know that rowdy Roddy Piper. He was a, uh, a big pro wrestler, especially during the 1980s. Deceased today, unfortunately, but uh, he's here playing John Nada. Now, by the way, the character that he portrays, who's the star of this film, he's actually not called any name within the course of the movie. When you get to the end credits, you see him credited as Nada, which means nothing in Spanish. In subsequent interviews, John Carpenter refers to the character as John Nada. So I guess he is John Nada, although you won't get that from the body of the uh, the story. Now, he is a drifter. He lands a temp job at a construction site, and there are strange doings in the church across the street from this little shanty town that he resides in, kind of on Skid Row in Los Angeles, and that causes him to investigate. After the place gets raided by the cops, Nada discovers what looks like ordinary sunglasses, but they happen to be specially engineered sunglasses with lenses that allow the wearer to be able to see the world for what it really is. Well, what it really is, he soon discovers, is that America is actually being run by aliens who have become the one percenters in our country. They've been brainwashing humans into submission through subliminal messages. Nada decides he's going to fight back, but that also makes him a target of extermination for these aliens. These ghouls is what really Carpenter calls them. With no one believing him, it's really up to one man here to try to take down a pretty sinister and oppressive system single-handedly. A lot more to the story than that, but I'll get into some of the details during the body of this review. Now, John Carpenter, at the time before he started thinking about They Live, this was the period just after he made Big Trouble in Little China, he decided he was going to take a little bit of time off from filmmaking. He was really burnt out on doing films, and he decided he was just going to relax. And what he saw when he watched television, one of the rare times when he wasn't in his filmmaking cocoon, sparked a rude awakening in Carpenter. He couldn't believe after all of the social upheaval within America in the 1960s and the 1970s, that Americans could support Ronald Reagan. They took a hard right turn in terms of their political philosophy. They now embraced corporatism and commercialism, consumerism, materialism, Well, all-out greed, really. Americans actually wanted the rich to be even richer. They were brainwashed, according to Carpenter, into thinking that the wealthy need more money so that the riches that they would spend would trickle down to the poorest among us. That was the philosophy of the trickle-down economics of Ronald Reagan. Now, while times were good, admittedly, for the people up top, The middle class during this period started to falter. Many of them started to fall beneath the poverty line. Unions started to dissolve. A lot of the power in industry shifted to favor the corporate elites over the workers. 
And yet, Americans applauded all of this. And that made Carpenter think that many Americans must have undergone brain death. The poor, the sick, the homeless, they started to be seen as dragging this system down rather than being seen as merely a byproduct of a system working only for the people at the top. And humans were willing to destroy the planet for future generations just to make an extra buck today. Carpenter observed that everywhere he looked, somebody was selling us something. All of this conveyed the message that if we're not buying their product, we aren't living. Consumer culture had Americans in a stranglehold. And in Carpenter's view, that weakened society by promoting greed as good and all of the other traits that we had come to know as honorable, they were considered bad because they got in the way of financial success. The Reaganites were so clearly pro-profit and anti-everything decent that Carpenter could not see the humanity in any of their actions. That the American people were buying into this corporate power structure, keeping them down, was obviously the result of some skillful brainwashing efforts. Carpenter's idea for They Live really ignited after he read a comic book published by Eclipse Comics in 1985. It was called Alien Encounters Number 6, and within the pages was a noirish eight-page tale called Nada. It was written by Ray Faraday Nelson and illustrated by Bill Ray. Nada was an adaptation of Nelson's short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning that he had published in November of 1963 within the pages of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And in that story, there's a man named George Nada who's accidentally awakened, in a way, by this stage hypnotist. And he finds, when he looks around, many people in society are not really people. They're actually lizard-like creatures. They have multiple eyes. They're kind of squid-like. They're called fascinators in the story. And they've put all humans under hypnosis to make humans think that they, these fascinators, are also human, while they're also putting out messages around town, within television and radio and on posters, with subliminal messages such as work eight hours, play eight hours, sleep eight hours, or marry and reproduce. Although Nada disconnects his television, he can still hear the televisions of his neighbors voicing things like, obey the government, we are the government, we are your friends. He can only hear the subliminal messages, they're not subliminal to him, but his neighbors under the hypnotic spell cannot hear that at all. They just hear the escapism and the entertainment provided by their televisions and radios. This story really resonated with John Carpenter. These feelings that he held, that he alone could see the ills of American society so clearly, but nobody else really could. So what was obvious to him seemed invisible to everybody else, that the Reagan administration, he felt, was a den of thieves, and everybody was being hoodwinked by them into giving more money and power to the ultra-rich in American society. These forces had shaped American society into conformity, into just doing what was necessary, into consuming. And Carpenter wanted to awaken everybody from their current hypnotic state through entertainment. Carpenter secured the comic book rights as well as Nelson's original story, and he updated them with a modern twist. The Reagan revolution was orchestrated by these elitist aliens who are living among us. They're exploiting Earth like a third world planet so they could live like royalty among us. They're bombarding humans with messages over and over within our media to keep us distracted. Meanwhile, they're stealing our society out from under our feet. They're enslaving the poor. They're draining wealth from the middle class. And they're living by this new golden rule. The golden rule being that whoever has the gold makes the rules. Carpenter's chosen title, They Live, isn't just about alien existence. We learn a little bit more about that phrase when Nada enters the church and he sees graffiti on the wall that reads, they live, we sleep. These insidious aliens are the ones who are living life the way that it should be, while the rest of us in humankind are either accomplices or we're living in a perpetual hypnotic fog. Carpenter during this period, he felt going mainstream in Hollywood had not been serving him well, either commercially or creatively. He sold the rights to do Halloween for the return of Michael Myers in 1988. And he wanted to return to the low budget filmmaking of his early days when he had full creative control and he seemed to enjoy himself a lot more making movies. Along these lines, Carpenter went into a four picture deal with Shep Gordon and Andrew Blay, who ran Alive Films. The contract granted him the artistic freedom to do one film a year, costing about three to four million dollars for four consecutive years. These films included the first one, Prince of Darkness from 1987, followed by They Live, 
Slated third was this time travel actioner called Victory Out of Time that was written by Carpenter's then-girlfriend and future wife, script supervisor Sandy King. And there was a fourth one that was going to be named later. Alive sold the domestic distribution rights to Universal Pictures through part of their deal and the international rights to Carol Co. When they got to the script for They Live, MCA, which was Universal Pictures' parent company, they became reticent about Carpenter's anti-corporate message in his movie. They thought he had been setting his sights on them. This was a commentary about him being dissatisfied with a major studios. Universal chair at the time, Tom Pollock, he suggested Carpenter expand the aliens and their motivation beyond just wanting money. Maybe they wanted humans for food. That was kind of like V in that way. Carpenter, though, had final cut, so he kept his ideas as they were. During his meetings with uh, Universal, there was an executive there that asked Carpenter why he thought it was a threat to humanity to sell out for money because we all sell out every day. And Carpenter, he turned around and used that line in the film. Now, as far as the motivation of these aliens, one thing that Carpenter had in mind was he had read this book by Joe McInnes called Fatal Vision, which was turned into a miniseries in the early 1980s. It chronicled the real life story of how Jeffrey McDonald killed his family back in 1970. He didn't have any remorse or a sense of morality to anything that he did. He had no concept of right and wrong. And Carpenter felt that similarly, money was causing people in American society to push away morality out of self-interest, maybe even self-preservation. This resulted in others suffering But that didn't matter because they were prospering. They didn't have a pang of guilt at all about what the nation was becoming so long as they were living the high life. In our current society, the true lives of the poor among us are pretty much invisible to the rich. The rich don't want to see the poor. They just want to get them out of the way because seeing them means having to do something about them. So they live very secluded and sheltered lives. They'd rather live without a care in the world. And Carpenter felt, you know, what if the true nature of the rich was equally invisible to the poor? Carpenter's concept for They Live, in which the aliens, which he dubbed ghouls, were not seen in their natural state unless you had these special sunglasses. But he didn't want to do hypnosis because that explained things way too quickly, and it was important for Nada to get others to experience this with him. Sunglasses offered a visual to explain without needing words, and in addition to these sunglasses, he would explain that there was a frequency wave connection of a sort to this TV station that provides a shortcut to explain the technology behind the mass hypnosis all over the world. When you look through the lens, you see everything in black and white, and that black and white recalls The Wizard of Oz because in The Wizard of Oz, when you see something in black and white, that represents the reality of Dorothy's existence. Color is her fantasy. Similarly, in this film, Carpenter is also commenting on how Ted Turner was colorizing classic films purely for money. Colorization is really commercialization, and that's how it's viewed in this film as well. For They Live, Carpenter worked with cinematographer Gary Kibbe because he trusted his expertise on cameras. Carpenter felt that he was a good enough cinematographer to make up kind of the slack with his inexperience. He had promoted him to a cinematographer on his previous effort called Prince of Darkness. And Kibbe worked with Carpenter to capture the sunglasses point of view vision in decolorized black and white to see the subliminal messages all around. These messages included such things as watch TV, marry and reproduce, obey, submit, stay asleep, no independent thought, conform, consume, do not question authority, honor apathy, and doubt humanity. The dollar bills that they held displayed the message, this is your God. Carpenter's friend and frequent collaborator, Jim Danforth, he handled the visual effects for these scenes as well as other things within the course of the movie. Some stop motion animation, there are drones that are watching our every move. The matte paintings are used for these posters on the wall, including the POV shots that change from color to black and white and back again. They intended to add some electronic interference when you're viewing things through the sunglasses, and that was meant to simulate the painful process of prolonged use of them. But that proved to be too costly, so they just simulated headaches. When somebody wears them, they just take them off and they're holding their the bridge of their nose as if they're having pain in their head. The idea was that it's painful to see the truth, the pain that we tend to avoid by living in complete ignorance. Now, as he set to write his script, John Carpenter knew that he needed a hero that audiences would identify with and enjoy. Many of Carpenter's heroes share qualities of a certain close friend that he had growing up, and Kurt Russell really 
fit this mold that Carpenter really was not going to be able to afford him with only three or four million dollars or any of the many alternates that he considered to be suitable. So he had a big idea happen to him just by happenstance. He, Carpenter was a wrestling fan since he was a child, a big wrestling fan, and uh, he attended the retirement match of Roddy Piper in the Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan at WrestleMania 3, and he saw many of the qualities that he admired for his anti-heroes within Piper. He liked Piper's tough, scarred, but very kind face, and he looked like somebody who had lived a life of hard work. He was not a glamorous pretty boy, and he oozed charisma, but he was still very down-to-earth and identifiable, and he felt that he would be perfect to play Nada. He invited Piper out to dinner to make him a movie offer. Now, although Piper did not know who John Carpenter was at all at the time, he really couldn't say no to a starring role in a major motion picture, especially now that he was retiring from wrestling. He didn't even ask what it was about. He just said yes. He really wanted to increase his worth outside of the World Wrestling Federation. He didn't want to be confined by Vince McMahon, who was considered kind of a control freak. In fact, McMahon didn't want Piper to make movies with anybody else. He offered him a movie within four weeks for the same fee if he agreed not to do They Live, but Piper proceeded to do it. He found out who John Carpenter was. He was kind of blown away by the movies that he had made. So he split from the WWF into these uncharted waters and hoped for the best. Now, because his lead was inexperienced, Carpenter tailored Nada around Piper's persona, you know, he had some father issues. He left home as a teenager. He was homeless from time to time. He worked odd jobs. Piper even refused to take his wedding band off, just as he refused to do when he was wrestling. While Carpenter was writing the script, Piper handed over several sheets of notebook paper that contained phrases that he liked to use during wrestling interviews, like, Life's a bitch, and she's back in heat, and I've come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. If that sounds familiar to you, you probably played the uh, Duke Nukem 3D in the mid-1990s that paraphrased that line. It popularized that line for a generation of gamers. Now, for his sidekick, Carpenter cast Keith David after enjoying his work when he did a film called The Thing back in 1982. Keith David came to the Prince of Darkness premiere as uh, J Carpenter was conceiving of They Live, and Carpenter observed David as somebody who could stand his own against Piper because of his physique, and also he could mentor Piper because he was an inexperienced actor, and Keith David was a very good actor. So David was interested in doing it, so Carpenter wrote the character of Frank Armitage for him. And Carpenter also used the name Frank Armitage for his screenplay credit. Carpenter initially claimed in interviews that Armitage was real. He was a real-life, first-time writer that was kind of like a brother to him because they really had a connection, and they saw things the same way, and he was just giving him a first break in films, but in actual fact, he came to admit it later, he was, in fact, Frank. He just didn't want a credit because so many of the concepts came from other sources, especially Ray Nelson and input from Roddy Piper, as well as his uh, girlfriend at the time, Sandy King. The name Frank Armitage, by the way, comes from an H.P. Lovecraft short story called The Dunwich Horror. Carpenter happens to be an, an avid admirer of Lovecraft, especially in the way that his hidden worlds live underneath the surface and they get revealed very lavishly. And he kind of thought they live fit that mold in a certain respect, maybe not as lavish. Now, as Piper was a popular wrestler, he could really handle the stunts, except for one fall out of a window. He pretty much did all of them. Carpenter wanted Piper's fans to see him do his thing because they pretty much were going to pull a lot of those wrestling fans in by having him as the lead. So Carpenter developed a wrestling match between Nada and Frank in the body of his story. And the conceit here is that Frank does not want to put on these sunglasses because finding out the truth meant having to act on whatever he sees. He'd rather live in a state of willful ignorance because he's providing money for his family. He doesn't want to rock the boat. And Nada's task is to force Frank into seeing that they're all being used and to break out of his hypnotic state. So Frank fights tooth and nail to keep living in the false reality because his family needs that money. And that's similar to how many people turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world that they don't want to see because they just want to be able to do the simple things to keep their existence going on. The fight was written in the script without any kind of details. It was just a blank page that just had the words, the fight begins, and there were several pages that were either blank or they just say the fight continues, and then another page that says the fight concludes. Stunt coordinator Jeff Imada, by the way, Imada plays most of the ghouls that you see in the film, 
Imada choreographed Piper and David with Carpenter's only instruction being to include three wrestling moves, a clothesline, a suplex, and a body slam. So with that in mind, he decided to just create this lavish, very well orchestrated fight scene. Carpenter, who really was a big Western fan, in fact, he thought he was going to get into the movie business making Westerns. He wanted to emulate the lengthy fight that occurs between John Wayne and Victor McLaughlin in John Ford's The Quiet Man, except he wanted his fight to be much more absurd and to last even longer. So they took about six weeks to try to come up with their ideas for what they wanted to do. A couple of those weeks were rehearsing in Carpenter's office backyard on the choreography of this fight, including making actual physical contact. And so they added some dialogue, some character touches on the fly to show their progression from frenemies to allies by the time you get to the end of this fight. The scene took about four days to shoot in this alleyway. It looks like there's actual asphalt there, but it actually has a lot of padding on the ground that's meant to look like the actual concrete on the ground. The on-screen fight takes up about five minutes, a little over five minutes of screen time. Imada says that Carpenter, in fact, cut out at least a minute of the full fight that they had shot, but the absurdity of the fight is certainly there, and it's meant to symbolize the difficulty in changing somebody's worldview. It's easier to con somebody than to convince them that they've been conned. And that's certainly true for the people in They Live. Now, They Live, obviously, it's it's a wish fulfillment film from Carpenter. A lot of backlash toward the so-called me generation and their single-minded quest for wealth and power. It's no coincidence that all of the aliens are affluent whites because a lot of the people who are rich and are running the country, at least especially at that time, were affluent whites. Humans that abet the enemy gain privileges by betraying their own kind. One human that Nada tries to wake says that if she puts on his glasses, she's going to tell him she's going to see whatever it is that he wants her to see, indicating that, like so many who live under an oppressive state, she's going to do whatever is necessary to survive by placating those who have the power in the moment. Now, as far as the look of the ghouls, Carpenter worked with Prince of Darkness makeup artist Frank Carasosa for these ghouls that were actually conceived of by his girlfriend, Sandy King. They're essentially humans whose corruption has drained them of humanity. At least that's how they look. They're barely retaining the last shred of the human form before they decompose into nothingness. Their continued existence requires that nobody knows or cares that the world is being controlled by those at the top, resolved to obey and to keep food on the table for themselves and their family. John Carpenter and Alan Holworth collaborated on the memorable music. Carpenter wanted to evoke the grapes of wrath, so he opted for this kind of trotting, plodding, bluesy vibe for the film. The score features blues guitar and harmonica and saxophone, but after a dispute over money issues, this would end up being the last collaboration between Carpenter and Howarth. They Live was originally slated for an October 7th release, and that was because Prince of Darkness kind of came out around the same time and it did relatively well. People want to see kind of scary movies, but it wasn't really that scary of a movie. So they kind of pushed it up a little bit to be a little bit more toward the election day for 1988. So it really came out the weekend before election day on November 4th, 1988, maybe a little too close to election day for its warnings to really sink in to the voting populace because George Herbert Walker Bush won the presidency continuing the Reagan legacy essentially for another four years. But it still was a hit in that it made $13 million. It only had a budget of about $4 million, so it did make some money. It debuted at number one, in fact, when it was first released, but by the time Thanksgiving rolled around, it was pretty much mostly out of theaters. Carpenter said that the public's ignoring of They Live was kind of like the refusal of Frank or anybody else to put on the glasses. They would rather sleep and obey than have to deal with the consequences of knowing the truth of what's going on in their society. Critics were pretty mixed on They Live when it came out. Some really were kind of knocking Carpenter. They expected him to make better movies when he had Final Cut instead of just another B-movie. Others railed against uh, the gratuitous violence in the film. In fact, that's kind of spoofed in the movie. There's a Siskel and Ebert-like couple of TV critics that you see toward the end of the film. They really are calling out people like John Carpenter and uh, George Romero by name for their gratuity in their violence. Other critics did complain about the bad acting. They singled out Roddy Piper as not really a good actor at all. Some didn't like the cheesy dialogue or maybe some of the cheap looking effects, but others who were more positive, they praised its B-movie charm and its enjoyable goofiness. Today, it's pretty much considered a cult classic, an overlooked 
gem of its era and many critics actually give it a positive review today if you go to rotten tomatoes i believe it's in the 80 plus percent positive range so it's definitely been reevaluated as a pretty good film from carpenter now as far as me personally i've often struggled with they live i really love so much about this film and it is better than i think you would expect given there's an experienced star as the hero of it and it's a pretty small budget it is a little bit frustrating that it doesn't quite live up to a lot of its premise and its promise of its premise. It is still really campy fun, though, and it gives you something to think about. I mean, it has a really great idea for a movie. It's more entertaining than enlightening, I would say. But conceptually, I do think They Live is brilliant, and the concepts are likely going to be enough for many viewers to overlook some of the inherent issues as a narrative. I think with more time, there really was the potential here to make a great science fiction film instead of just putting in a bunch of great satirical ideas that sometimes work, sometimes don't. These ideas explored by They Live lie mostly in the beginning, I feel, descending into kind of a low-budget actioner toward the end that, while it does maintain entertainment, it's not really as compelling as the setup. I mean, the reveals in this film, I think, are the best part of it. You know, those ideas were recycled in a lot of other films. Some of them better, a lot of them worse. You know, a lot of films really took on a lot of the same concept here. I think The Matrix, perhaps, is the most successful example of doing They Live, at least doing it with the kind of budget and the kind of time and the kind of conceptual follow-through that John Carpenter really was not afforded at that point in his career. The Carpenter was allowed one big-budget film during the Alive Films contract period. He passed on several big-budget projects. He opted to make Escape from L.A. for DEG, but you know this is where things all went wrong for John Carpenter's career. DEG went bankrupt in 1989. His contract with Alive Films pretty much was aborted at that time because Carpenter started to have disputes with Universal. Carpenter ended up suing Gordon and Blay for $3.6 million in 1990, and they issued him a countersuit for $7.5 million, also for breach of contract, contending that Carpenter was not going to be able to deliver the third film, Victory Out of Time, anyway, on schedule, and that's why they ended the contract because of the writer strike, and that really left the screenplay on hold. Carpenter contemplated for a bit uh, having a They Live sequel called They Live to Hypno War that never really got made, unfortunately. And unfortunately, even though his career got derailed shortly after They Live, Carpenter also was disappointed that he never really did get to wake up America against Reagan's policies, which he feels never ended. He says the 80s never has ended in the minds of most people. Unrestrained capitalism did bring the Great Recession in 2008, the middle class, bore most of the brunt of that. No punishment for the ghouls who created that recession. Carpenter today says that Donald Trump, who really blossomed during the Reagan era, he's kind of the epitome of a ghoul hiding his efforts to feast under a coiffed mane and a tailored suit. Carpenter says he's saddened to realize, despite his film being around for over 30 years, that people still are buying into the subliminal messages. Except they don't need to be subliminal anymore because the super rich have the working poor Supporting their ghoul agenda, most of all, in fact, the base of the party is a lot of the working class people that Carpenter thinks are the ones who've been exploited. So a lot of heavy stuff within the course of this very entertaining B-movie concept. And certainly that's why a lot of people come back to They Live again and again. And it is very brilliant in its conceptual design and certainly a great metaphor for many people as to what's going on in this world. And that's why I give They Live three stars out of four. Three stars on my scale means I do think that this is a very worthwhile film. For people who like this kind of movie, if you love your B-movies, your sci-fi, your action movies, if you love Roddy Piper and John Carpenter, you're certainly going to get a lot of mileage out of this. It might even be a four-star movie for you. If that's not necessarily your cup of tea, you're probably going to notice much more the flaws in this film. The story doesn't always quite make sense if you really want to think about it. There's a lot more questions and answers within the course of this movie. You know, it doesn't really hit home with acting and visual effects and some of those other things that they try to throw in here. It really does feel kind of schlocky most of the time. However, for me, I actually think that there is a very good film that is trying to bust out, but it's limited here really by the restrictions. John Carpenter didn't have a lot of time to make the film. He didn't have a lot of money to see his vision come to life. So what we're left here is a really great B-movie, and that's why I give it three stars out of four. You know, the legacy of They Live really has catapulted it into really a cult masterpiece for a lot of people. They've talked about trying to remake this movie. In fact, in 2008, the year of the Great Recession, Universal Pictures and Strike Entertainment, who had produced the prequel to The Thing, 
They tried to make a remake of They Live. D.B. Weiss was assigned to the first script, but uh, a few years later into 2011, Matt Reeves came in to be the writer and the director, and he ultimately rewrote it and changed the name to not They Live, but Resistance, because he intended it to be much more in keeping with the Ray Nelson story than John Carpenter's adaptation of the story, more of a psychological horror piece. But that film, Resistance, has remained in development hell ever since. If you have your own thoughts on They Live and you want to impart them to me, you can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. As far as what I'm going to be talking about next week, well, there's a film that actually is not a film from the 1980s. It actually came out in 1990. But still, it was a film that was conceived for many, many years during the 1980s and was very much influenced by a lot of the 1980s. So I'm going to count it here because it is a great companion piece to They Live. It's another movie with a blue-collar protagonist who wakes up to the world being completely different than what he expects. It is starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it is called Total Recall. And I thoroughly enjoy that film in many respects, so I'm looking forward to delving deep into Total Recall for next episode. So check that out if you want to keep up with the reviews. And until then, thank you so much for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. (laughs) 